Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Naufel. And today we are going to be dealing with the prosthetic options that are involved in dental implantology. So last week, we basically had to discuss with all the surgical options that were available to us, as well as we dealt with the different steps and stages involved in those surgical options. So today I'm going to deal with the same basics from a prosthetic point of view so that you're well aware of the entire scenario that happens along in the dental implant, you get your basics straight. So before I move on directly to the prosthetic options, I'll be doing a small rehearsal of the surgical options so that your concepts, your prosthetic options are clear as well. Okay, so let me just do a quick revision about the surgical aspect before I delve into the prosthetic scenario. So this is what we discussed the last time around, right? The implant basically involving different fragments or components. This is the screw portion, which is going to be embedded directly into the bone. From the screw portion, we have another small screw coming up, which forms the connection or a bridge between the crown as well as your implant, okay? So these are the basic options or uh, the basic uh, fragments or components of the implant system, which consists of a crown, an abutment, and an implant itself. So we dealt with how a tooth is different from an implant, right? You cannot consider an implant as a tooth because it does not have PDL, it does not intrude or migrate, lacks that same amount of proprioception that a tooth will have, and the crown implant ratio is totally different in case of your growing individuals. So why was this so important? It's because in a tooth, we have the PDL, which acts like a shock absorber. So this shock absorber helps us to direct the forces acting on the tooth in different directions. However, implant does not have the same. So because of the absence of a PDL, we are not the entire forces, so the bulk of the forces start hitting the implant directly which could lead to a bone loss in the future. So we were discussing all these concepts as well. Also, we had talked about how the different forces are variable in cases of a tooth, but in implant, they are directly moving into the crest of the bone. So if your implant is not placed properly or your prosthetic is not done properly, this could basically lead to a change. So when I'm talking about a change, I'm talking about the forces moving in different directions, leading to a failure of the implant in the future. So we have to make sure that we avoid all these scenarios by first placing the implant in the right option, then the right segment, along with loading the implant perfectly, what we'll be dealing with it today, okay? Also, we discussed of, again, the forces of how we're directed, what's the difference between moving in a straight line and moving it away with result to the bone loss and we discuss the different types of implants. So if you remember from last class, we were talking mainly about the endosteal implant. So this is what is practiced almost 90 to 95% of the time. We practice the endosteal implant and that we usually use the root form type of implant itself. And coming to the bone density, why the bone density was so important was because of the amount of bone basically tells us how much dimension of an implant we can place or how good the bone is for immediate or delayed loading. So like I discussed in the last class, a D1 bone, which is usually seen in your anterior mandible, is the best bone. And that can be actually immediately loaded. But your D2, D3, and D4 bone, because it consists of more trabecular bone and less amount of cortical bone. You can see in your type 4, a trabecular bone is more but your cortical bone is very less because of which an implant could fail in the future. Because of, so if we don't, don't load it immediately, we leave a couple of months for the implant to fuse onto the bone and then give the appropriate result, all right? So D1, as we know, is the best. D2 is all right. D3 is still okay, but D4 is the worst. And you might be asked questions remembering the tactile analog. This is a very common thing, which is part of uh, not just neat questions, but is also important from a, uh, the bone density point of view. So you should know that D1 represents your oak wood. So I gave you the pseudonym, what you have to use to remember all this in form of bone density. So once you know the bone density, you can also help in your planning of your implant. So you know exactly, for example, this is where your nerve is. 
This is how we basically read a CBCT. Why a CBCT is more important is because it is three-dimensional. Our OPG has not been used predominantly for planning because it's a 2D image. A CBCT is a 3D image. Okay, so this is why a CD CCT is always referred for implant planning. You get to know what height of implant to use, how much should be the width of the implant, everything. So you can plan it and choose an appropriate type of implant scenario. So this is where we plan our implants. We get to know exactly how to position them so that the opposing tooth can also rest on your prosthetic. So an implant placement should always be a prosthetic driven option and not a surgical driven option. Okay. So we discuss the steps once more with regards to how we go about placing the implants, a nice reflection we can do, which you took a nice BP blade number 12 or 13, make an incision all across and reflect the flap on either side. All right. And then we can place our implants. Sometimes we do that's called as a traditional open flap surgery. Sometimes that is not required, which we make something called punch holes into your gums and after we make these punch holes we directly drill the implants so we avoid excessive bleeding we avoid an infection risk and recovery like a gum so it's like a small cut right so because it's like a small cut we are able to see it much better or to visualize it much better compared to what we see in a traditionally flap surgery so this is, but this is not possible in all options. It's possible very uh, rarely when we have just a single space available for the punch to go in there and give us a adequate reflection. Okay. And this is what we discussed last time as well. The drill placement, we have something starts with two millimeters, which is referred to as your pilot drill. Okay. So this is your pilot drill. The first drill, what you place to make a small opening into your bone after which depending upon the size of the implant we go to the corresponding so we go to 2.75 3.2 3.5 4.3 depending upon what implant you're placing suppose you're placing a 4.5 millimeter implant we do not drill till 4.5 millimeters we drill just up to 4.1 or 4.2 millimeters and then we push the implant through so that we have that nice hold on the bone we want a nice tactile sensitivity with the bone. We do not want it to just float into the bone space. So always one drill less. Okay. So once you've finished drilling for the implant, we go ahead placing the implant. We either the hand torque, which we use something like this, this is for hand torque, or we use a machine torque, which uses the physio what we have itself for forming the total amount of uh, placing the but itself the implant itself okay and uh, yeah so these are basically the steps after we place the implant we check for how much torque we have okay how much torque which is available when we pushing the implant through and then we place something called a cover screw a cover screw is just to make sure that and the cover screw should always lie at the level of your gingiva right at the crest basically this is to make sure that the gingiva grows over it and covers it because we do not want any food accumulation around here and then to that causing an infection and causing a problem later on okay so this is with regards to implant placement the cover screw placement and in case we are doing a immediate loading we place a healing screw you can see the difference in this screw and this screw right a healing screw is usually placed if you're doing an immediate loading a cover screw is not placed for immediate loading why is because we want the gums to heal according to the healing screw this is called the healing screw or the healing abutment so we want the gums to heal according to the screw what you're placing in immediate loading right we do not place a cover screw we place only the healing screw this is what you have to understand with regards to the surgical aspect of the implants okay uh so once we have placed it, we check for the torque, but the torque is good. Why the torque is so important is because the osseointegration, integration, that is the fusing of your implant to the bone depends on what torque is available. Ideally speaking, you need a minimum of at least 30 Newton per centimeter square as your torque, which can go up to 70 to 80 as well in cases of your D1 bones. This is also good enough. 
all right so yeah this is with regards to your osseo integration so this is what usually happens after we place the implant this is in the first 24 hours we see erythrocytes macrophages and uh, a lot of inflammatory markers from the tubes which surround the implant along with what we see in the different time period right from the 24 hours till up to the six to eight week okay so 24 hours we see these inflammatory markers come all across the surface now that is followed by the formation of your different monocytes as well as formation of blood supply so you're regulating blood supply to the bone which is usually lost during the procedure okay follow it with we have our osteocytes and osteoblasts forming just to make sure that the screws which you see around here also get covered with your new bone a new bone formation occurs that is referred to as secondary stability primary stability just make sure the implant does not come out of the hole that you have drilled a secondary stability make sure that we are just making sure that the implant is going to last within the bone for years to come okay so primary stability usually if there's a good torque of 70 to 80 we can use it for immediate loading if not it's better to wait for delayed loading till all this cycle occurs so the first would be your inflammatory markers your neutrophils macrophages erythrocytes we have a blood vessel formation to occurring following it up with uh, bone cells to occur to form the new bone so you can see over here a new bone starts occurring place between the implant and the bone this is what keeps it in place okay okay so this is with regards to the surgical uh, phenomenon the question is can we immediately load immediate implants Yes, immediate implants are meant for that, right? So we, what we do is we place an immediate implant. We wait for a week in which the healing screw is also placed, okay? Uh, so we place the healing screw. We wait for the implants to, uh, for the gums to heal, to take the surface of the day, and then we take the impression. So within a period of two weeks, we give the prosthesis also. But this is usually advisable in cases of your d1 bones okay so in d1 bones we ideally use immediate loading but d2 d3 d4 people do it but i wouldn't advise that you do it okay that's because i want uh the thing uh, you want to make sure that the bone heals comfortably i see a lot of blurred videos uh comments uh, I think either resolution is less. Just can see if you can improve the resolution on your side because we are checking it in the system and it's working fine. Just check if the same issue basically arises for you. Okay. So this is with with regards to the surgical option. I hope the surgical option is uh, clear to you. Do you have any doubts with regards to the surgical option before I move on to the prosthetic scenario? Have any doubts with regards to the surgical scenario? Yeah, everybody can just improve your resolution. I think it should start working better for you. So you will not have a blurred video. I think just because the resolution has decreased, it's having an issue. Okay. So this is with regards to your surgical. I hope it's clear so far. I'm now moving on to the prosthetic acid. So we had discussed till here in the previous class. So I just revised the entire concept for you. Okay. So now we have placed the implant, okay? We've placed the implant and we have waited for six months, four to five months or up to at least six months should have elapsed after you have placed your implants. So once that is done, okay, what we do the first stage is we remove the cover screw. So we all saw the cover screw which was placed over here. We remove the cover screw and we place something called a healing screw. In an immediate implant, we place directly the healing screw. We do not place the cover screw. But in case of a delayed implant, what we do is we are removing the cover screw. So we do something called a stage two surgery. Stage two surgery or your prosthetic surgery. So what do we mean by a stage two surgery is that we do not open an entire flap. We already know where the implant is placed, 
right? So we know where the implants are placed and we just open up that area, remove the cover screw and place a healing screw in its place. Stage one was your implant placement. Stage two is called as a prosthetic surgery or a healing screw surgery. So once we place the healing screw, we wait for one week, okay? So we've placed the healing screw, we wait for one week. After one week, we have to take the impressions, okay? So after one week or seven days has elapsed, we take the impression. So how do we take the impression? We remove the healing screw and we place abutments, okay? What are basically abutments? Abutments are your connection or a bridge between your implant, which is inside your bone, and the crown, which is going to be placed in the future. Okay, so you can see the screws over here, right? This is called as an abutment screw. This abutment screw gets locked into the striations which are present inside the implant. Okay, so we cannot place anything else. We have to place the abutment screw and join it to the implant that has already been uh, drilled into the patient's mouth, okay? So now you see this case, for example, you have all your anterior teeth missing. We placed three implants and then we have now placed the abutment. Abutments of the same company are preferable to be placed. Suppose you have placed the different companies that you know, different implant manufacturers, Suppose you have placed a Noble BioCare, which is the best company at the moment. The Noble BioCare, you have placed Dentium, or you have placed Alpha Bio, the different companies, right? So you've placed their implants. It's better you use the same abutments that you're using. Do not do mix and match, okay? Do not use an implant of a different company and abutment of a other company, okay? So use the same abutments of the same company, and you just have to screw it into the implant. Now, once we have this, we take an impression of this directly. This can be done either with a putty. I think you've all read elastomeric impression materials. We have different consistencies, light body, heavy body, medium body, and putty. So what we do in implant impressions is we use either a putty plus light body impression. Okay. So we have placed the we have placed the abutments inside the implant and we take an impression of the abutment only along with the rest of the teeth. So it can be putty plus light body. In case it's only one implant, just one implant, then you can try doing an alginate impression, which I will not advise, but this is for certain scenarios, okay? But preferable is going for a putty plus light body combination for taking impressions, okay? So this is with regards to your abutment. Also, in case you are not comfortable taking an impression with an abutment, that you think that you might by mistake damage the abutment, there is something also called as impression copings, okay? So these are impression copings, which come in two types. They are called as open tray, yeah? and closed tray, depending upon the technique of taking impressions. So you have two types, open tray impression copings and closed tray. So you can see how small this is, right? This is referred to as a closed tray impression coping. If you see how large this is, you see how large this is, right? This will not fit into your normal impression tray. So they are referred to as open tray. How do we do is we have an impression tray. So we've all seen your normal stock trays, right? We've all used impression trays to somehow try and gag our patients during our undergraduate days, patient puking all everywhere, right? We've all been there. So we, that is a tray what we use normally. So for an open tray, what we do is we cut the area which has to be recorded from the tray. We use our stripe burrs, what we use for your denture trimming, right? And we just cut off that portion of the tray. So now what will happen is this impression coping will start poking through the tray. And it can, and after you've taken the impression, we release this lock. You see a lock over here, right? We release this lock and we remove that 
impression coping and when you remove that it comes along with the tray itself a closed tray is more simple to take an impression of but an open tray is more accurate so you understanding the difference open tray it is you have to cut an entire tray just for taking an impression right but for a closed tray you don't have to do anything like that because the size is very small a closed tray will be only this much small it will not be as big as this so you can easily take an impression but an open tray you will be too large to fit in your impression tray because of which <clears throat> you are forced to cut a tray so this is exactly what a closed tray impression looks like okay so you see the difference this is a closed tray but this is an open tray you can see the difference in the components so understand this a closed tray is the most simple procedure to take an impression but an open tray is the most accurate impression technique okay do not confuse in both the copings are different for an open tray and different for a closed tray okay so i'm just showing you a closed tray impression so we place the impression coping directly into the patient's mouth the same way how you place an abutment then you use a putty light body combination what i was talking to you about and take an impression when you retract or relieve the impression from the patient's mouth you get an impression like this okay so you get an impression as good as like this so what we do is we unscrew this from the patient's mouth and place it back into the impression this is referred to as an indirect transfer okay this is referred to as an indirect transfer why is it called as a transfer because i am transferring an impression coping from the mouth into the impression indirectly okay why is it not called direct it is not called direct is because when i pull this impression out this coping did not come along with it okay this will come along with it in case of your open tray impression this is referred to as also a direct transfer you understanding we place the impression we remove the screw okay when we remove the screw and we have the impression in hand this comes along with the impression this will come out along with the impression you remove the impression that is called as a direct transfer okay but because i am manually removing this from the mouth and placing it back into the impression it is called as an indirect transfer okay i hope it is not too confusing for all of you is this clear i really hope it's not confusing that's the difference between open impression coping and closed tray impression coping and between direct and indirect transfer okay i hope this is clear so far for all of you right you can still ask me if there are any doubts i'll be happy to clear it as we keep going along okay so this is your impression step in case of your prosthetic rehabilitation of your implantation after you have taken this impression you place the impression coping inside okay in case you have taken an abutment so sorry for the interruption everyone i just lost power we are back again so we just discussing the different types of prosthetic so once you've got the copings you've got the impression we it looks something similar to this okay so once we've got the transfer we can then move it into the cast now if you're doing the same thing with regards to an abutment level impression right if you're doing an abutment level impression the step remains the same we remove the abutment from the patient's mouth and we put it back into the impression itself right so that is with regards to your impressions the question between what is an external and internal hex okay so you see this cross section inside this if your attachment is more towards the outer surface of your implant that will be your external hex if it's more towards the inner surface of your implant that is your internal hex the design of your curvature changes okay that is with regards to your external and internal hex so you can see this is what the striations look like inside the implant morphology so depending upon where your connection lies is referred to as external hex stands for hexagon okay it stands for external hexagon or internal hexagon 
ideally speaking an implant usually has both but internal hexagons are more common compared to an external so it fits on the surface of the implant on this surface as well as from the internal surface as well that is your broad definition of external internal hex hope that's clear okay so we've got the impressions okay and then we place it on the cast so this is basically a replica of the patient's mouth so whenever you are asked why do we need a cast why do we need an impression your actual answer is to always be because it's a replica of what they we cannot do all these procedures in the patient's mouth itself which is why we do it on a cast and then we transfer it into the patient's mouth okay so you have different analogs like these are called as lab analogs so the whole point of lab analogs is that they replicate an implant so now the implant is in the patient's mouth you cannot possibly remove it from the patient's mouth because it's also integrated into the bone so how do i fix the abutment or the impression coping into the cast we have something called lab analogs which behave like a implant so these lab analogs are placed inside the cast okay they are placed inside the cast and they replicate what an implant will be in the patient's mouth to these lab analogs we fuse the abutment or the impression coping so now we have an actual replica of the patient's mouth in the cast okay a little bit too much for all of you but just keep this in mind so you know the different components a lab analog is just a replica of an implant which is there in the patient's mouth this gets joined to the impression coping or your abutment it could be the impression coping or it could be an abutment and it just join so that we can pour a cast perfectly and do all our procedures on this cast okay well, one thing what i had to discuss with you earlier which i want to discuss with you now after your procedures are slightly clear now what we discussed earlier was something called straight abutments okay so straight abutments are straight 90 degrees connection between the implant and the bone but not always your implant is going to be perfectly placed because your bone might differ your angulation might have differed because of which your implant is slightly more labially placed right so what do we do when your implant positioning is not as accurate enough we cannot use a straight abutment so for this we have something called an angulated abutment okay this is referred to as an angulated abutment so what do i mean when i say angulated or angulations okay so these are this is join the implant at a 90 degree angle but i can push them not to be so labially and push them more lingually ideally they are used in your anterior cases okay so what we do basically the steps remain the same but after we place our healing screw we check whether the prosthetic is going to be too forward okay for example our implant is supposed to be straight okay but because of lack of bone or because of placement it has become like this so you can see a prosthesis which is going to come out of this implant with a straight abutment is going to be too far off labially so how do we avoid this we use an angulated abutment what does an angulated abutment do is it will join this at 90 degrees but the abutment will come at an angle more inside when it comes more inside the prosthesis also will come more inside okay so you can see the angulation how it's changing over here right this is 10 degrees this is 15 this is 25 this is almost up to 40 degrees there are different angulations which are actually available so you have to choose how much angulation i need to make my prosthesis more lingually placed and not more labially placed you can see over here we have used two different angulations one a uh, 15 degree angulation one a uh, 25 degree angulation and placed the 
abutments okay so because of which the processes now will look more neat and clean and tidy and more inside it look more aesthetic compared to a badly formed processes so just because your implant is not uh, placed correctly does not mean it is out of your hands we can still manage with the help of angulated abutments they come in different angulations from 10 all up to 45 degrees okay this is with regards to your different abutments the material remains the same that is your titanium the material does not change only the angulation change and this is your difference between your straight and your angulated abutments okay so we finished your impressions we finished your abutments we finished your lab analogs okay next comes your prosthesis i hope there are no doubts so far if uh, uh what i didn't understand the question can you just repeat the question what is based on the type of gingiva the abutment if you can just repeat a question i'll be happy to clear it right so we have now different types of the abutment okay the abutment you are dimensions basically the angulation does not change upon your gingiva biotype because you just want to push it more inside the biotype will not determine it however if you see that the gap this is different from the gap which is there in other abutments okay if you want you can increase this so the height of the abutment can be varied according to a gingiva biotype if it is thin you can have a nice 0.5 if it is thick you can have two 2.5 mm uh, broader abutment but your angulation should not be depending upon your gingival biotype the thickness or the height that can depend on your biotype okay i hope that's clear so once you're done with that we have something called the final stage so now you already have a cast so because with this cast the technician is going to make your crowns or your prosthesis okay so what he does is this abutment forms like how you prepare your tooth right you have a tooth preparation you prepare a tooth based on that your technician forms a crown the same way what we do over here is that we make make form a crown based on the abutment like how a tooth preparation a tooth is small we make a crown here the abutment is small and we are going to make the crown on this okay so suppose a single tooth is missing the doctor the implantologist has already placed an implant we remove the cover screw put a healing screw wait for one week after the one week has elapsed what we do is we place an abutment or impression to coping take the impression transfer it to the lab analog the technician gives you this crown we have to place this crown in the abutment okay this is one type we can do an implant bridge a three unit so this is a pontic right these are your connectors and these are your retainers but the only difference is this is going into a implant so because we have a uh, three teeth missing we don't need three implants we can also make an implant bridge in which we place two implants and join it with the help of a pontic so the physiology remains the same what you read in your fpd basics okay it's the same thing nothing changes sometimes you could also have an entire arch or entire quadrant missing this we call it as a hybrid prosthesis okay so patient tells you he wants only fixed he does not want your complete denture which is removable this is where we can do something called a hybrid prosthesis now you see how many implants are there 1 2 3 4 this is called as an all on four concept all on four what do we mean by all on four the, all the teeth right from your second molar to the second molar other side are all supported on four implants okay so that is what we refer to as a hybrid prosthesis or an all on four concept now suppose the prosthesis were resting on six implants we will refer it to as an all on six concept or an all on six prosthesis okay so we just all of this is made there's a small titanium plate over here and all the teeth are made along with it we just screw it to the we, along with the help of the abutments are attached to it already here so we just screw it to the implant and that remains permanently 
the advantage of screwing it is that i can retrieve it the factor of retrievability becomes so much more important so i can retrieve this after a couple of years and then rescrew it if i'm going to cement it the chances of retrievability are very less okay so these are the usual prosthetic designs a single implant crown an implant bridge or a hybrid prosthesis all these are the implant processes that are available right now and technicians do it okay they also come across a difference of two types of processes referred to as screw retained and cement retained what is the difference in a screw retained the crown and the implant are one unit they are joined together okay they are not separate they are joined together and you screw in the crown into the implant so this is an example so you see an implant is there the crown and the abutment are joined to each other okay but because the crown and the abutment are joined to each other you can easily screw it inside and this hole is covered with composite the biggest advantage like i mentioned earlier of screwing it is that i can remove it whenever i want the factor what i'm looking for is that retrievability that is the biggest advantage of a screw retained compared to a cement retained in a cement retained process these the crown and the abutment are separate so what do we do is we first screw the abutment inside and then we cement the crown to the abutment you understand what i'm doing screw retained i'm directly screwing it into the implant cement retained i am cementing the crown to the abutment what is the biggest disadvantage of cement retained i cannot retrieve it there is no retrievability but what is the biggest advantage of a cement retained this hole what you see over here i cannot have it in my anterior teeth imagine my anterior teeth are like this and there is a small hole over there however well you try to mask it with composite that hole will stand out so i cannot use cement retained mostly i cannot for an anterior case if you feel the hole is coming on the labial surface i cannot use cement retained so cement retained is more aesthetic okay when i say aesthetic i mean it looks much better combined compared to your screw retained so it can be used for your anterior cases but your screw retained is good with retrievability and i prefer it for my posterior cases okay i hope you know the difference now we learned a bit too much don't get confused screw retained cement retained is different the different types of processes are again variable lab analogs what is the use and direct indirect transfer with your open tray and closed tray impression copings if you do not want to use impression coping that is also okay you can use your abutments okay so this is with regards to your prosthetic mechanism for your implants so example you seeing this implant right it's slightly more labially forward so if i'm going to place a crown it's going to come slightly ahead so what do we do across we place an angulated abutment and we go for a cement retained so when i'm going for a cement retained there is no access hole over here so this can be used in anterior cases and it looks more aesthetic compared to a screw retained uh yeah the question is is an impression play any role for screw retain no it does not the lab technician is going to do this at a later stage okay so it is not going to be important whether you it's screw retain or cement retain the impression step remains the same the impression transfer remains the same as well as on the cast it remains the same after you have given the impression to your lab technician you will tell him or her whether you want a screw retain or a cement retain based on that your lab technician will fabricate a crown okay angulated also the same thing it does not change whether the impression does not change what i have shown you here that concept remains the same okay i hope it's clear so this is with regards to healing screw and then placing a prosthesis all this can be done from the period of healing screw to the peeling of crown can be done within a period of 7 to 10 days itself you do not need a long time 7 to 10 days you are done from the healing screw phase you finish impression lab technician gives you a crown 
and you go either and cement it or screw it. Okay. This is with regards to the processes. So the summary. We drill a hole, we cover with cover screw, we remove the cover screw, place a healing screw till the gums heal, after which we place an abutment. And on the abutment, we either screw the crown or we cement the crown to the abutment itself. This is your entire gist of implant procedures. I hope it's clear so far. Yes, anybody has any doubts? You can ask me and we will proceed. I'll keep answering as we keep going along. Okay. So this is what I feel you should know with regards to your implant scenario right from stage one that is implant positioning and stage two that is your prosthetic planning okay so you've complete all the steps all the clinical steps and what happens in the lab and the difference between each of them okay so now what you have to understand is you can keep putting in your doubts i'll keep answering as we go, keep going along all right first thing what i see is which cement can be used we can Normally use even your GIC, but what we normally do is we use our zinc phosphate cements. Okay, we use zinc phosphate, but even GIC has been used earlier. That's not an issue because either way the retrievability becomes a problem. So if you ever you thinking aesthetic is not of a prime concern, go for screw retained. But whenever aesthetic is important, go for cement retained, and we can use either zinc phosphate or GIC as cement. Please do not use resin cements because resin cements retrievability becomes thousand times more difficult. Okay, so we are going to be dealing with implant failures. You can keep asking me questions. We're going to keep answering. Don't worry about that. So what happens and how do I assess an implant failure? Okay, first things first. You will see some amount of redness or inflammation around the gums or the gingiva of the implant. After that, you will see something called a small opening like a sinus opening or you will see it comes slightly more mobile okay and then you will see bone loss all across the implant which, which after which the implant will fail what are the initial changes that are seen first things what you see is a bone loss starting very close to the screw which will start expanding across your cortical plate okay so you see a blackish discoloration all across the implant that means it is a failing implant. It's called as peri-implantitis. Okay. The word what we are looking for is referred to as peri-implantitis. So the first signs are bleeding, bleeding gums. Then you will see discoloration or redness of the, of the gums followed by slight mobility along with bone loss. If you see, see something like this, also a lot of bone loss, this implant is going to fail in a very small gap of time can i save a failing implant ideally if it's you see a bone loss more than 50 percent you cannot save it okay if you see only up to 20 percent then you can what we do is we use even after six months we open up the flap again clean the area around the implant around this area we place some bone graft and we suture it again. Okay, that is to save a failing implant, but only 20% of bone loss. If 50% of bone loss occurs, that implant, even if you place five packets of bone graft, will not be able to succeed. Okay, so this is with regards to your failure. Also, sometimes what happens is you see the crown is moving, it's shaking. Okay, it's shaking. Don't always think that the implant is failing. Because what happens is sometimes, because there's a screw over here, which tight, which goes into the crown, that must have become loose. So not always a crown which is moving, or implant crown which is moving, means the implant is failing. It could also mean that the implant screw, which was used to tighten the crown to the implant, that has become loose, okay? You just have to open it up and tighten that abutment screw, nothing more. Do not always consider a uh, moving prosthesis as a failing implant. Okay. So what we normally see bleeding, we see recession, we see some fractures, the crown fractures, and we see a lot of bone loss. Okay. 
So these are all the failures of an implant, bone loss, recession of your gums, because what happens is the cement sometimes stays back, which causes your gums to recess. We have bleeding. Also, we have fractures of your abutment screw and your abutment also. So these are the common failures what we see in your implants. I hope this is clear, right? So these, what we discussed so far was with regards, though I wanted to answer the first MCQ, okay? This is with regards to the architecture, what is seen. So what we normally see with regards to an implant is that we, the questions what we normally see are the components. We see the placement design. We see the different steps. So we just involved all of that together in our two classes. And you should also know the failures what may occur. That is what is important with regards to an implant discussion. Okay. So can you all answer this question for me? Which of the following shows the difference between a peri implant and periodontal mucosa? Yes. So I see an answer with regards to attachment of collagen fibers, right? So what for answering this question, you have to know what is supposed to be there and what is not supposed to be there, right? So first, what you have to know is the four things what we normally see in a implant, a very healthy implant mucosa, okay? Keratinized mucosa is seen. A very good mucosal thickness is seen, supracrestal tissue height, and peri implant bone thickness. All of them are characteristics of a healthy implant. Also, we see a good margin to be formed and a peri implant bone crest and mucosal java. So we'll just compare what we have here with regards to what is the options. Stratified squamous skeletonized epithelium, yes, it's supposed to be there. Sulcus lined with sulcular epithelium also is supposed to be. And viable biological seal between implant and epithelial cells, good again. What is not supposed to be there is your collagen fibers. So if collagen fibers are there, it means your implant is actually failing or is going to fail very soon. So the answer for this is your attachment of collagen fibers. This is not supposed to be there. In your periodontal mucosa, okay, so this is what a healthy peri-implant mucosa looks like. You can see the small recession occurring, that is mucositis. But if there is a gap forming between your implant and your gum, followed by an implant and the bone, that is referred to as peri-implantitis. Do not confuse yourself between mucositis and implantitis. Mucositis, there is a small recession of the gum, up to 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters only. Okay, nothing more. Up to 0.5, it's good. I still mucositis. But you see uh, even more bigger gum recession, then it's referred to as peri implantitis followed with bone loss. Okay, good. I see one of you got it correctly. Perfect. The answer for the earlier MCQ was D. But sticking the same way, know the difference in mucositis and implantitis, you'll see inflamed mucosa on both sides, okay? Very less bleeding in case of your mucositis, a lot of bleeding in case of your implantitis. Both may have suppurations, but mucositis does not have bone loss. But there is a lot of bone loss in implantitis with a probing depth of greater than five millimeters, okay? So this is with regards to your mucosal attachments of your implants. I hope this was clear. You can continue to ask me doubts if you do not understand this. Okay. So coming to the next question, pretty simple. We've discussed this, a term which describes the ultra structural contact between bone and an implant. The word what you're looking for is ultra structural. Okay. The answer is B, that is your osteointegration. We discussed osteointegration in the last class and just a small discussion today as well. So that is your P, that is your osseo integration. Ankylosis, we all know what it is. It is a bony adaptation to the bone. If you see the word of fibrous attachment, then it becomes your fibrous integration. Okay. So they play with the words quite a lot. So do not confuse yourself with regards to the words, what is seen in cases of your MCQs. Okay. 
Now, one more thing what I want to discuss, which I did not have much time to discuss when we went in earlier, was your materials. Okay, I'll just deal conversation just after this materials part of it. What you have to understand is that when we implant materials were introduced, we had metals and ceramics. Metals, a lot of them were introduced. At the moment, we are using titanium and titanium alloys. The 6AL stands for aluminium, 4V stands for vanadium. Okay, so now it's a combination. We're not using commercial titanium anymore, we're using titanium alloys. Titanium joined with aluminium and vanadium. Okay, and we also have cobalt alloys to an extent. Ceramics, we have, we have some certain zirconia implants which are coming up these days. A lot of research has gone into them along with zirconia abutments. Okay, so there are different types, inert and bioactive. And these are the different types. Now, zirconia has become very famous among all of these. So these are your dental materials with regards to what the implants are made up of. Okay, zirconia, there will be mighty questions. Zirconia abutment is there in today's world. We are using it. It's there in India as well. So just do not push it away okay so if i was ask you a question the less frequently used dental implant biomaterial is which one what will your answer be a b c or d alloys of titanium aluminium vanadium or platinum which do you think is the less frequently used do not get confused the word is less okay what don't we use a lot in dental implants everybody can you just answer this pretty simple question what do you think the answer is? D, good. Platinum is not used, okay? Platinum is not used as an implant biomaterial. Alloys are used, aluminum used, vanadium is used, definitely used, okay? Along with that, we also have palladium, which can be used, that's okay. So platinum is never used as a thing. So the answer is D, platinum. The same thing, I will change the question. The most widely used dental biomaterial implantology is good D titanium. Okay, that is why we had a small discussion on the biomaterial. So you answer questions like this. The question is between titanium and titanium alloys. The answer will still be titanium because titanium alloys started being used in the last two to three years. Okay, so if your option was titanium alloys over here, the still answer will be titanium only. You do not go for alloys because now only the alloys have started being useful more okay now if i was to ask you this question which of the following is responsible to prevent the attachment so we discussed how collagen fibers on the implant surface are not seen so if i asked you which of the following is responsible to prevent the attachment of collagen fibers to the implant surface what will your answer be plasma spray biocompatibility of your implant surface absence of cementum on the implant surface or acid etched or blast implant surface what is your answer anybody you can keep going i see see i see absence of cementum i see biocompatibility is an answer anybody else yes anybody else what else do you think is an option see okay so just to explain this what i want to tell you is this is how your implant materials are going to act okay so you have your implant material okay after you have placed it what you want is you want osteoblast to sit on your implant you do not want bacteria to sit on it how do i make sure that osteoblast and osteocytes come towards it but bacteria does not okay so the simple thing what i have to do is i have to make sure these chemicals are very much active on my implant surface that is your magnesium zinc your silver calcium copper yeah and i also want to make sure that my surface is the hydrophobic property you know what is hydrophobic it hates water water repelling is also active on my implant surface so among these options which makes sure that all that happens anybody among all these options, what makes sure that my hydrophobicity, my property is active, my chemicals are active on the implant surface, and also makes sure that bacteria does not grow? The answer A is so very close. Second, the answer what you're looking for is D, 
that is your acid etched or blast implant surface. So whenever an acid etched blast, so whenever the manufacturer gives you an implant, it is already acid etched and blast. So you are not supposed to touch the implant screw with your gloved finger. That is a rule, 100% rule. Because what happens is you contaminate the implant by even touching the implant screw with your gloved finger. So you always take an implant with your implant hex and then place it into the bone. That is why you're not supposed to do it. Okay. So the answer for this is D, acid edge blast implant surface. Implants are also plasma sprayed, but for this answer, it is number second option. Always go for the acid surface. I hope this is understandable. Also, we have something called hydroxyapatite, which you must have read earlier, which is coated onto the implant surface. Okay. Now coming to the sixth MCQ. Just identify this instrument for me, all of you. Is it an implant ratchet? Is it a physio? Is it an osteoderm or an implant hand driver? What do you think this is? This is a board of your picture-based MCQ. What do you think this is? Ratchet, physio, osteoderm, or a hand driver, right? This is an implant ratchet, okay? You see this hexical design, right? This is on which an implant driver will sit and that gets joined to the implant. When you move this in a direction, which is clockwise, a clockwise direction, it helps to push the implant more inside, okay? Whenever you push it in an anti-clockwise direction, so clockwise pushes the implant in, anti-clockwise direction, it helps to take the implant out. Suppose your positioning was not good, you want to pull the implant out, you go in an anti-clockwise direction, and help to push the implant outwards. This is referred to as an implant ratchet. Implant physio is the machine which is used to operate the drill. It tells you how much torque you can to drill the bone. That is your implant physio. Osteotome is mainly used for sinus lift. If you want to push the sinus more further away from your bone, we use something called an osteotome to lift the sinus and then place an implant. An implant hand driver is like I told you, fits into the ratchet to push the implant further in. So I saw a question about countersinking, right? If we, have, if we feel that our implant, uh, like I told you earlier, implant is supposed to lie at the crest of the bone, right? Sometimes you feel that the torque is not good enough. So what we do is this, we push it ahead. We then do an anti-clockwise direction, pull the implant slightly outwards and push it in slightly more such that it lies below the crest of the bone. So countersinking is a procedure in which we push the implant slightly more deeper than then intended along the crest of the bone to make sure that primary and secondary stability is achieved at the same time. So we are pushing the implant lower than the crest of the bone with both our clockwise and anti-clockwise direction. That is referred to as a countersinking procedure. We do it very rarely but we do it when our angulation is not correct or the bone or stability we have achieved is not good enough. Okay. Do we have any more doubts? Do we have any doubts that we want me to clear? I hope this was useful, beneficial and understandable to most of you because this is a slightly complicated topic. So you have to understand that in your MDS, if you're going to prosper, we have four books just on implantology, right? So I just tried to make it as simple and as understandable for your level. And I hope this was comfortable for all of you. You have any doubts? You can just let me know. I'll be happy to clear it. Yeah. So yeah, if you have any doubts, we can just continue along with it. Or if you want me to close the session, we can close the session, right? So yes, best of luck, everyone. Yes. We will discuss a few more topics similar to this in the coming days. I hope it will be useful for all of you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Take care.